If you can't stand know-it-alls who think they're smarter than everyone else, you're really going to hate what comes next. It's the Paperback Warrior Podcast. Welcome to the Paperback Warrior Podcast, episode number 98. My name's Eric, and this show is a flagship of our popular blog at paperbackwarrior.com. It's there that you can find hundreds of reviews of vintage fiction and genres like espionage, crime noir, mystery, horror, science fiction, fantasy, gothic, westerns, and even graphic novels and comics. You'll find a new review every weekday because we eat, read, write, and sleep. So who's we, you might ask? I'm referring to my broadcast partner, co-writer, and friend, Tom. You're never shy, Tom. Say hi. Thank you, Eric. Our feature today is on Gil Brewer, who is regarded as one of the greats of the paperback original era. We're going to discuss his life and career and briefly review some of our favorite Brewer novels. Also, we have two vintage paperback reviews to share. First, I'm going to review a 1959 novel called The Graves in the Meadow by Manning Lee Stokes. Eric, you're going to be reviewing a doomsday vintage paperback called Path to Savagery by Robert Edmund Alter. Needless to say, this show is going to be awesome. As I can see by what's in front of you, you have been doing some shopping. What'd you score? I'm going to hand this over to you right now and take a look at this. Uh, Big reach. Okay. So I'm really enthusiastic about this crime fiction author named Robert Colby, who lived from 1916 to 2016. During the paperback original era, he wrote some amazing crime and adventure novels, the best of which is called The Captain Must Die. He's up there with the best of the Fawcett Gold Medal authors, and his reputation is probably undermined by the fact that he didn't write that many books. Most of his novels are still in print from Prologue Press. Here's where it gets interesting. He wrote six stories for Alfred Hitchcock Mystery Magazine between 1975 and 1980, starring the same hero, a guy named Brock. Brock is a freelance operator who hunts people engaged in larcenous activity. He takes pleasure and profit from making them pay an appropriate penalty for their crimes. He likens himself to being a tax collector for the devil. So we have these six stories, all of which are supposed to be just great, but they're hard as hell to find unless you want to drive yourself crazy searching for 40-year-old copies of the Alfred Hitchcock Digest. The stories are all called Paint the Town and then a color. Paint the Town Black, Paint the Town Green, etc. You get the idea. So Colby also wrote one called Paint the Town Aquamarine that was never published because Hitchcock Magazine changed ownership and the editor who was championing his work was gone. So this extra story, Paint the Town Aquamarine, was never published. The good news is that this publishing house that I'd never heard of before called Cimarron Street Books has compiled all of the Paint the Town stories, including the unpublished one, into one trade paperback volume that I handed you right now. The paperback volume is called The Devil's Collector by Robert Colby. Now, the guy who made this happen is Peter Enfantino, who has an awesome fanzine called Bare Bones. He's one of the guys behind all the Stark House manhunt compilations. So resurrecting lost short stories from Digest, that's, that's his jam. Anyway, I have the paperback here. It's kind of a nondescript cover, uh, but I am so psyched to read and review this. Anyway, like I said, the book is called The Devil's Collector by Robert Colby, and it's available in paperback uh, on Amazon for 13 bucks. or else you can try to drive yourself nuts trying to find the short stories. Any quick impressions looking at it? Tom, uh, this uh, publisher I'm not familiar with, Cimarron Street Books? I'm guessing it's Peter Enfantino's, uh, you know, I hate to call it a vanity press because that, that insults it, but I, I, my hunch is that it's his uh, his press outlet. It's probably, I don't even know if there's any other books on that. Uh, I have not gone to their website. Yeah, yeah, it's really well done. I love this, uh, the way they lay it out. It's great. Yeah, I'm, I'm psyched. In fact, I'm gonna, it, it, since I dragged that off the shelf in anticipation of this uh, podcast, I'm going to make this, put this on the short list and read it. It may actually, the review may be posted on Paperback Warrior uh, quick, sh- soon thereafter this podcast comes out. Excellent. And... Tom, I found this uh, book in my collection. Reach, reach, there right. you go. All right, give that to me. It is a book called The Wheel is Fixed by James M. 
Fox. I'm not so familiar with this one. Read that little blurb under the uh, under the title. Okay, it says a crime king stooge until he sees an innocent girl tortured. Well, that sounds like an interesting afternoon. <laughs> fun reading for the family. Um, I, not the tortured girl being fun. That would be <laughs> dreadful. Uh, it's, but uh, tell me what you know about this. Well, it's got a cool cover. It sure um, does. Yeah. As you can see, it's Adele Matback, number 573, for those of you that keep up with those sorts of things. I wanted to know who this guy was, uh, James M. Fox. So I did some research and discovered the author was actually, oh boy, let me try this, uh, Johannes Mathis Willem Nipshear. Oh, man. I think it's... <laughs> I think it's Johans, ah. it's Matthias, and then <laughs> Willem, and then either Nipshear or Knipshear. Yeah, okay, what you said. Uh, he was born in 1908 in Holland. Uh, according to the LA Times, he started writing mystery novels when he was a teenager, and he wrote them in Dutch. Uh, he became a lawyer, and then at some point moved to New York to be a legal advisor to the Minister of War of the Netherlands during, uh, during their exile during World War II. He moved to L.A. after World War II and started writing more mystery novels. According to a, let me see here, 2013 post on the Passing Tramp blog, uh, Knipshear is best known for writing hard-boiled private eye novels starring a husband and wife team named Johnny and Susie Marshall between 1943 and 1957. Prior to 1945, he apparently wrote four espionage thrillers that aren't related to the Johnny and Susie Marshall series. Tom, I think what may appeal to you is a three-book series of police procedurals known as the Jerry Long series. You've got my attention. All right. Uh, they consist of Code 3 in 1953, Free Ride in 1957, and Dead Pigeon in 1967. I do believe that Code 3... Uh, was also released under the title Deadshot. He also had a two-book series starring some sort of international spy or secret agent guy named Steve Harvester. Uh, those books were Dark Crusade and Operation Dancing Dog. Along with this novel I handed to you, The Wheel is Fixed, he also had four other standalone books, of which Save Them for Violence from 1959 that one looks amazing. Uh, the LA Times also reports that he wrote two military novels based on his own military experience, uh, The Iron Virgin and The Exiles. And that's what I've got on Mr. James M. Fox, real name, whatever you said. So to be clear, this book in my hand right now, is that part of the Jerry Long series or is this a standalone? Standalone. Okay, got it. Yeah. Do you know if you have any of his books? I, I actually searched in anticipation of this conversation because I had an informant tell me that you were going to bring him up, and I do not. Ah, okay. All right. I've never really seen him out in the wild. So. Yeah. And has anyone reprinted him, as far as you know? Not that I know of. All right. Big opportunity there for the reprint houses who hang on our every word. All right. So why don't we uh, go on to the feature, if you don't mind spinning that platter, Daddy-O. <laughs> Our feature today is on Gil Brewer, who is regarded as one of the greats of the paperback original era. Gil Brewer was born in Canandaigua, New York, in 1922. He was drafted into the Army during World War II, where he served for three years in Europe. While he was away at war, his parents moved the family to St. Petersburg, Florida. Gil's dad, who was also named Gil Brewer, was a writer for the pulp magazines, and Gil Jr., our Gil, that is, wanted to follow in his dad's footsteps. After Gil returned from his army time, he lived with his family in Florida, and he started writing. Now, the family was poor in Florida. Gil's dad was an alcoholic with mental illness problems who eventually was committed to a VA hospital where he died. They relied on Gil Jr.'s checks from the army to make ends meet, and when those checks ended, Gil's mom wanted him to get a job and basically kicked him out of the house. So Gil takes his typewriter and rents a room in a house occupied by four old spinster ladies who took care of him with chicken wings from their dinners. <laughs> he, he set out to write, okay. and he sets, he sets out to write the great American literary novel. And he writes three books at once while maintaining a steady booze buzz in his room with these three old ladies. He finds that long, complex literary works, surprisingly, were just hard as hell to write. So he took a part-time job at the gas station and at a cannery to cover the $5 a week rent he was forced to pay. 
So he meets a woman named Beryline. He gets married and moves into a small St. Petersburg apartment with her. Now, the year's 1950, and Gill sells his first short story to a Detective Tales magazine for $64. And this finally makes him a professional writer. He leaves the apartment with a check, and he comes back with a bag full of liquor. 1950 was a significant year for Gill for another reason. It was the year he had a revelation. Writers who could produce a 180-page pot boiler were getting paid decent money in this new medium called the paperback original novel. Gill had met a fellow writer who had success in the pulps using the name Day Keen. Day Keen hired Gill to expand one of his pulp stories, Mary the Sixth for Murder, from the 1948 issue of Detective Tales magazine into a full-length novel, and Gill did it. The book was released in 1951 called Love Me and Die by Day Keen, but the paperback was actually written by Gil Brewer. More accurately, I guess you could say it was probably best regarded as a collaboration between Gil and Day Keen, since the original short story was all Keen's. In that apartment, Gil began writing another novel called Satan is a Woman <laughs> that he sold to Fawcett Gold Medal, the most prestigious paperback house in this new market. The book was published in 1951, and he also sold his next novel, So Rich, So Dead, also published in 51. However, it was the next book that he wrote that was the real game changer. It was called 13 French Street, and it was a monster hit, selling over a million copies, and it's been reprinted over 15 times since then. It landed Gill a deal being represented by the Scott Meredith Agency, who had a near monopoly on supplying the writers for Manhunt Magazine, who began printing Gill's short stories. So Gill and his bride then get a bigger apartment. Gill's able to buy a car and lots more booze. He became part of a loose fraternity of St. Petersburg writers who would hang out with one another. Imagine, Eric, this group of dudes hanging out together. You had Day Keen and Gil Brewer, Harry Whittington, Jonathan Craig, Talmadge Powell, and all these others hanging out at Harry Whittington's house, talking shop and drinking. During the 1950s, Gil Brewer sold 20 books and countless short stories. His big trick was that he could write fast. Some of his books only took three days to write. Other books took five. But over time, the booze and the pills took their toll, and his productivity began to sag. After selling eight books between 1960 and 1962, Gill went for four years without getting a paperback published. The drinking became so bad that he wound up in a mental hospital in Arcadia, Florida. It became clear that while his writing had eclipsed his father's career, his drinking and personal demons were also rivaling his father's issues. His late 1960s work wasn't his best. The high points were his 1967 pair of novels called The Tease and Sin For Me that Starkhouse has reprinted together. He also wrote three tie-in books for the It Takes a Thief TV show. Now, things went further downhill in the 1970s for Gill. He wrote four gothic novels as Elaine Evans, some sleaze sex books as Luke Morgan, some thrillers as Harry Arve, and two books in the Soldato series as Al Conroy, Marvin Albert's other pseudonym. Here's an interesting piece of trivia for you, Eric. Gil Brewer wrote an unpublished book in the Mac Bolin Executioner series called Firebase Seattle in 1975. Somewhere in the world, there is this transcript of a Mac Bolin novel by Gil Brewer, but it never made it to paperback. Now, the timing is the interesting because uh, Don Pendleton didn't stop writing the Executioner books until 1981. So I have no idea how Gil Brewer became involved in the series in 1975. Candidly, I can't imagine that the book is any good. Anyway, Gil wrecked his Porsche in the 1970s and began taking pain pills. Uh. He was in bed most of the time with the pills and the booze, and he eventually died in 1983 at the age of 61. Now, his wife shipped out all of his manuscripts, stories, and correspondence to the University of Wyoming, where it remains on file today, available to be reviewed by academics. He wrote more than 50 novels and sold over 400 short stories. Now, regarding Gil Brewer's works, I find them to be wildly uneven. Some of his books that I read are among the best crime fiction ever, and others are just unreadable garbage. 
Now, if, a re- if any of the listeners want to visit paperbackwarrior.com, you can read reviews, good and bad, of about nine of his books, maybe ten. I thought it might be fun for us to talk about our favorite Gil Brewer books in case our listeners want to start out with the best stuff, which is always the way to go. Now, Eric, I think you and I may share our favorite Gil Brewer book. It's called The Vengeful Virgin. Since you, you reviewed it for the site, why don't you tell our listeners about it? Yeah, The Vengeful Virgin was a mid-era Brewer novel originally published by Fawcett, uh, their crest imprint in 1958. It was cited as one of Brewer's strongest works, uh, which led to Hard Case Crime reprinting the novel in 2006 with vivid, awesome new artwork. Uh, The story goes like this. Jack Ruxton is a young owner-operator of a floundering television retail and repair shop. His life drastically changes the day he meets a knock-em-dead beauty named Shirley Angela, who's working as a primary caregiver for an elderly invalid named Victor. In a combination of desperation and hot-blooded lust, Shirley asks Jack to assist her in killing Victor. The payoff is about $300,000, and that's been promised to Shirley in the event of Victor's passing. So with this tumultuous tuition, Jack's life becomes an education on, you know, things like sex, greed, jealousy, and murder. Does he make the grade? That's the question. While I haven't read all the Brewer novels, I think The Vengeful Virgin was probably his high watermark. The story's placement on Florida's Gulf Coast uh, paralleled the author's own residence in sunny St. Petersburg, which he alluded to, uh, which Tom alluded to earlier. Like his contemporaries in Dan Marlowe, Day Keen, and John D. McDonald, Brewer makes use of a crime fiction staple. Uh, Tom, you know what it is. The Florida Waterfront Cabin. There's so many books have that. <laughs> Jeez. We see it all the time, and it's here where the book reaches this violent uh, crescendo of regret and guilt through the murky haze of liquor. And the book incorporates all the genre tropes, but still remains today remarkably timeless. The paperback showcases the downward spiral of man's ruin, lovers on the run, uh, this inescapable, ever-consuming law enforcement dragnet. It is absolutely essential reading for fans of the crime noir genre. And Tom, I have you to think because you encouraged me to read that book like several times and I just kept passing it up. But I finally took your advice and man, I'm glad I did. It's a great book. Tom, which one did you want to discuss? Yeah, I guess I want to hype his best selling novel from 1951 that I talked about earlier, 13 French Street. It is so good. Our narrator is this guy named Alex Bland, and he's on vacation visiting his old war buddy, Vern. Upon arriving at Vern's house at 13 French Street in a fictional southern town, he's greeted at the door by Vern's impossibly sexy and flirtatious wife, Petra, a dame who just oozes promiscuity. Now, things are awkward from Alex from the moment he arrives because Vern has aged poorly and does a, va- ba- does a real bad job of feigning enthusiasm regarding Alex's visit. Now, Petra can't help but make bedroom eyes at Alex every time their gaze is locked. Now, things escalate exponentially when Vern leaves town on business, leaving Alex to his vacation at the house alone with Petra. Now, Vern's elderly witch of a mother lives in the house, and she keeps a close eye on Petra while her son is gone. However, that doesn't stop Petra from trying to seduce Alex every time the old lady's back is turned. If you enjoy your vintage paperbacks filled with sexual tension, this one is definitely for you. Eventually, the old lady's chaperoning becomes more and more troublesome, and you can imagine where that goes. It takes about halfway through the paperback before 13 French Street becomes a full-fledged crime noir novel in which bad ideas beget further moral slippage. It also is compelling as hell, and the pages just keep flying by, making it abundantly clear why this book was such a sensation 70 years ago. To be clear, there is some retrograde treatment of women in this book that would not fly today. But again, 1951 was a very different world. And while I think that The Vengeful Virgin was Brewer's masterpiece, 13 French Street is not far behind. It is just a lusty noir classic with a femme fatale that you will not forget. I cannot recommend this book highly enough. Briefly, Eric, do you have any honorable mention novels you want to recommend by Gil Brewer? Yeah, I really liked one of his uh, late era novels that you mentioned earlier, The Tease from 1967. It was originally published by the short lived publishing house Banner and thankfully was reprinted by Stark House Press. I guess you could say it's of the Ori hit variety. Um, a suburban man is seduced by a beautiful young girl while his wife's out of town. 
But the man learns that this fiery vixen is also on the lam from a bank heist. It was so good, and it had the same sort of sexy elements that made uh, vir- Vengeful Virgin so engaging. Tom, what do you what do you really call these types of stories? Or he hit like he wrote hundreds of these things. I guess they're femme fatale stories, and uh, I think a lot of it comes back to uh, James M. Cain in his books uh, Double Indemnity and Postman Always Rings Twice, where a woman is taking advantage of a guy who's just driven by lust, and, and she's baiting him into committing crimes that he would not otherwise do. Um, I, while, we, while we're on the topic, I guess I want to also recommend A Taste for Sin from 1961. It's about this loser with a violent past who decides to leverage the rich married lady that he's banging to change the direction of his life. It evolves into a heist novel with some really violent scenes. Again, that's A Taste for Sin by Gil Brewer from 1961. I also think I should plug the short story collections of Gil Brewer's work, edited by David Rachels and published by Starkhouse. The only one that I actually read was called Red Heads Die Quickly and Other Stories. It's a book of short stories. And the stories in the compilation are just amazing. In fact, it may be the best single author short story collection that I've ever read. It's really amazing. Every story in it just hits you right between the eyes. I think most, if not all of them, were published in Manhunt originally. Um, in fact, most of Gil Brewer's books have been reprinted by Starkow, so that's probably a good place to start if you want to read his stuff without breaking the bank. I should probably acknowledge the source material I use for this feature. David Rachel's introduction to Redheads Die Quickly was fascinating. Uh, I was turned to Paperback Confidential by Brian Ritt for biographical information. There's an essay by Verlaine Brewer, his um, wife, called Notes on Gil Brewer that was included at the Stark House reprint of Wild to Possess and A Taste for Sin that was also really helpful. Anyway, so let's shift gears right now, Eric. Without further ado, why don't you give us your book review? Tom, a couple of years ago, you read and reviewed a book called Swamp Sister. And it was a fossil, uh, fossil gold medal book from 1961. And it was later reprinted by uh, Black Lizard. It was written by Robert Edmund Alter, uh, a guy who wrote short stories for magazines and digests like Alfred Hitchcock Mystery Magazine, Man from Uncle, Mike Shane, and so forth. Tom, you absolutely hated Swamp Sister, so much that you placed the book into our not-so-prestigious Hall of Shame, a virtual purgatory we've created for bad books. Eric, that book sucked so bad, (laughs) and I will also say it is my only, it's the negative review that I gave that gave me the most hate mail from people who read my review and told me that I was wrong. So you decide for yourself, but I'm telling you, that book is terrible. People love it for some reason, but it is absolute hot garbage. Go ahead, though, with your review. Well, you probably chose it because both Swamp Sister and another book called Carney Kill are the most notable uh, crime fiction books that Robin Edmund Alter wrote. However, he also wrote a post-apocalyptic novel called Path to Savagery. It was published in 1969 by Avon, three years after the author's death in 1966. Uh, Path to Savagery was adapted into a film by Sony Pictures in 1979, that movie being Ravagers, starring Ernest Borgnine and Richard Harris. I've never seen the movie, but it looks really cool. But better yet, this vintage paperback book is totally awesome and is not, I repeat, not entering the Hall of Shame. Listeners, we've all had our imagination run wild at some point about Doomsday and how we would live our lives if civilization was nearly wiped out. I was fascinated by the old movie Dawn of the Dead when the uh, survivors were running around in the shopping mall, just living it up, and all the zombies were outside, so they were perfectly safe. And this book, which was uh, published before that movie, uses that same sort of concept. A nuclear war, in this case, uh, instead of zombies. So here's the deal. The book is set about 20-some-odd years after a nuclear war. What's left is a lot of gangs, packs of wild dogs, and on the coast, some of the cities are heavily flooded. Uh, the good guy here is a uh, is a guy named Falk, and he's a loner, and he just roams the co- he just roams the countryside looking for food and supplies, but he's armed with a Tommy gun and a forty five. The first half of the book has him fighting some bad guys in this old mansion, and then meeting up with this girl. But the second half has Falk entering a city that's mostly flooded. However, it has one of these large department stores uh, that they had back then. They weren't malls, uh, but the department stores had multiple levels and different departments for various things. Like a Macy's or a Gimbel's. Exactly. So this is like a giant Macy's, and uh, it's got multiple levels that are connected by an elevator or stairs. 
So kind of like a shopping mall, uh, Falk is exploring this huge store, which is mostly still intact. Uh, by w- roaming around the store, he finds he's not alone in there. Uh, soon he stumbles upon a group of survivors led by a warrior named Ran, R-A-N-N. And at first, Falk finds some peace with the group, but Ran's girlfriend actually has a prior tie-in to Falk. So the book culminates in Falk and Rand fighting over this girl. Uh, But it's not a normal fight. Instead, they both enter this giant department store, (laughs) nude, weaponless, and alone. So here's the the deal is, so basically the deal is whoever can kill their opponent wins the girl, uh, which makes the book's finale just a lot of fun. Uh, Falk and Rand, they hunt each other through the store's departments like clothing and housewares and furniture and sporting goods and camping so they're using weapons that they can find in these departments and um, they really just hunt each other inside the store it's awesome and i love the book and i recognize that it isn't perfect Uh, the author i mean he isn't like mesmerizing by any means but he's got enough spark in this narrative and writing to just tell a really cool cool story and it's a great concept and again this book is called path to Savagery by Robert Edmund Alter, 1969, Avon paperback, has not been reprinted, uh, but looking at uh, the online stores and eBay, it looks like it's really affordable out there for just a few bucks. Uh, So Tom, what's your review? My review is of a 1959 novel called The Graves in the Meadow by Manning Lee Stokes. Now, to the extent that he's recalled at all, Manning Lee Stokes is remembered for his pseudonym work in the men's adventure paperback series series titles. He wrote the uh, John Eagle Expediter series, uh, the Richard Blade series. Nick, he wrote a Nick Carter Killmaster guy. He wrote a series called the Aquanauts. However, Stokes really began his career authoring mystery novels beginning in 1945 and beyond. His crime fiction outbook included a largely unknown hardcover from 1959 titled The Graves in the Meadow that was later reprinted by both Dell and Manor Books in paperback. The narrator of the book is this amoral sociopath named Dick Ludwell who witnesses a murder of a middleweight boxer who refused to take a dive. Now, Dick was the only person to witness the killing at the hands of this mobster, and he correctly figures that this makes him a marked man. So Dick decides to hide about 100 miles from the city in his friend's vacant farmhouse, and this is where the plot really takes off. Now, the farm is located on the outskirts of a small town where everyone knows each other, and Dick assumes the identity of a dead hobo for his new life in exile. He meets a girl, and a sweet relationship evolves, bolstered by the lies Dick tells her about his identity and background. Uh, So you start to think that this is going to be the tale of a heel uh, redeemed by true love. And then, about halfway through the novel, right when you think you see where it's going, There is an absolute bonkers scene that turns the plot into this nasty, violent, noir book. I promise there is not a single listener who will ever forget the scene that sparks this paperback's turning point. I never saw it coming, and I read a ton of this stuff. From that point forward, the book erupts into one of the finest crime stories I've ever read in a long, long time. It reminded me a lot of Dan J. Marlowe's The Name of the Game is Death, but this Stokes novel actually predates the Marlowe classic by three full years. The paperback sprints to the finish with an exciting, bloody climax. A couple pages from the conclusion, you'll be dying to know what's going to happen at the very end. Stokes' plotting is superb, and he does a fantastic job of getting you into the narrator's warped mind. I can't, I can't honestly get over how exciting and wild The Graves in the Meadow is, and I can't believe it has not been reprinted since 1973. This forgotten paperback is definitely worth rediscovering. Readers should seek out a copy, and a reprint publishing house should figure out a way to acquire the rights and resurrect this lost classic. It is one of the highest recommendations I've ever made. Now, unfortunately, the book is hard as hell to find after the paperback warrior review inadvertently created a run on the market and went viral among vintage fiction fans. There, um, I have no idea what the intellectual property rights are to this book, And so I don't know if it's ever going to be reprinted again, but good luck finding it. Spend some money on this book. Again, it's called The Graves in the Meadow by Manning Lee Stokes. You will not be disappointed with this novel. 
All right. Well, that's a wrap on another episode. Uh, thanks for listening today. And remember to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and of course our blog at paperbackwarrior.com. There's a donate link on the top right-hand corner of the desktop version of that blog site. Feel free to throw some dimes in the tip jar. Uh, we aren't protected by a paywall, and we just want to keep it that way like forever. So on behalf of Tom, peace out.